ready to start making some gifts and products? Then stick around because that's what we're doing in this episode. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel and love CNC then make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest videos. Now earlier in the year I said we would move on to making products and gifts that we're able to sell and that's exactly where we're going to start today. We're going to be focusing on the CNC routers in this episode. I'll do a future episode where we're doing the same with lasers and then hopefully a third episode where we combine both the CNC routers and the lasers to get some really cool gifts. Now I'm not necessarily an expert on selling gifts but there are a few key things I do know. Seasons make a big difference and when you're going to get most of your sales. Christmas, Thanksgiving, Halloween, Easter, those type of times of the year is when people want to buy these handmade products. The other thing is personalization. If you can add a name, a location, a date, it just makes it more unique to the people buying them and ultimately more unique for the people they're about to give them to. The third thing is animals and pets. People love their pets. People love their pets more than their own families sometimes, so do remember that. If you're trying to make or think of products, then try and encompass one or all of those things I've just mentioned, and you're probably going to have winners on your hand. So what are we actually doing in today's episode? Well, we're going to make a series of products that you can hopefully sell on the CNC routers. Everything we're doing today is within the parameters of a 3018 machine. If you have bigger machines, you can still do exactly the same, either scale it up or just do it on the same scale we're working to today. Not to mislead you, some things are cut out on my 3018, some things I do cut out on the bigger machines just to save time, but as I say, it's all within the parameters of what a 3018 can do. Now, we're going to be doing it all within free easel, so nothing we're going to be doing today costs any money. We're going to be using the free tools and features within easel and free files that are available on the internet itself. Anything I use in today's episode will be available in the description area below. Do check it out where I put all the useful information information related to the video. Now the last thing to mention before we start is that I'm doing this on the basis that you already have some knowledge of easel itself. If you, if you don't, check out the beginner's guide in the corner because the bits we're about to go through today, I do go through at a slightly quicker pace than normal just to save repeating all the information we've covered in previous videos. Also, if you don't use easel, you can still do everything that we're doing today in all, all the other popular software such as Carveco Maker or Vectric. So yeah, definitely stick with the tutorial and let's see what we can make and dive in now. So now we're in easel, the first thing I've done is simply create a new file and called it Christmas Designs. I've set the size of the material to the size of my work area which is 300mm by 180 and the material I'm going to be using today is a piece of pine that's 18.5mm thick. So I've set mine to 18.7 just because I like to go that extra little step when we're cutting through to make sure it goes all the way through the material. Now, the, what we're going to do today is create a sweet tray or a catch-all tray in the shape of a Christmas tree. Now, you've got a couple of options in order to generate your Christmas tree. You can draw one out by hand using the various shapes and pen tool. You can come over to Google and just search something like SBG Christmas tree for free, and you'll have a variety of options that come up. For ease though, I'm just going to use the library within easel for today. So I'm going to click on the library icon, it'll open up at the library, we're going to search for tree and we've got one straight away. Obviously we've got the free options and we've got the pro options but for today the free option is perfectly fine. So we're going to click that and it should import it. Now on this stage we always have the option of how we want it to display within easel. For ease, we're just going to click the fill option for now because we're going to modify it shortly. I'm just going to enlarge this slightly by dragging one of the anchor points and bringing it up. Now whilst it kind of does look like a Christmas tree, I want to make this a little bit more festive for the, the sake of creating this little tray. So I'm going to come up here, add a star in. And first thing I want to do is bring it up and roughly get it to the size that I want using those anchor points. I want it to sit on top, I don't want it to be too big but I still want it to be able to be seen on top of the tree. Now the next thing I need to do is select both items and make sure they are aligned in the centre. So I've selected both and I'm going to select the centre alignment tool. And as we can see that just has shifted slightly and now they are perfectly aligned. The next thing we want to do is create a replica of this so we have basically an area that we can machine out as the middle piece for the fill and then an area on the outside for cutting it out of the material itself. 
So we'll select this and select the star. And then I'm going to right click and click combined. And this basically merges both shapes into one. So this is all one shape now as opposed to a separate tree and a separate star. I'm just going to scale this down slightly so it's not too close to the edge of our material. And bring this up a little bit. Now we're going to come over to the apps library. And we're going to look for the tool called offset. There it is. And once we click it, it should give us a few options. Now this is fairly self-explanatory. The distance is the what the distance away from your original shape that the new offset line is being created. So if we take that up, you'll see it gets further away and bring it down and it will get closer to the original shape to the point where it's actually overlapping the original shape. I'm going to put that to 0.25 as I was happy with that original measurement. Iterations is the amount of offset lines it will create. So again, if we take this up, you'll see it just starts to add extra lines to the outside. Again, I'm going to keep that as one. Inwards basically is the opposite to what we have now. So as opposed to the offset being on the outside of the original shape, inwards will make it on the inside of the original shape. Again, I'm happy with it being on the outside for now, so we'll leave that as it is. And as for keep original, I'm just going to turn that off for now because I just want the outline as opposed to keeping the original shape on the inside. So we'll go ahead and click import. And now we'll see we have our two shapes. Now what I'm going to do is select both of them and align them in both directions on the horizontal and the vertical, just so it brings them all back into one shape. And I'm going to shift this up slightly so it's not too close to the edge of the material. Now straight away on the visualizer you can already start to see what's going on is we've got the tray area in the middle and the outline which will be cut out. So let's set some depths on this now to actually make it a proper cut out tray. So the first thing we're going to do is set the outline cut. We're going to keep, click on the outline shape, come over to the cut tab and we're going to make this full depth. Now as I say my material is 18.5 millimeters, so this is 18.7 millimeters, just to guarantee it cuts all the way through. You'll see the tabs have been generated automatically. Now this is personal preference as to whether you have tabs on or not. I use blue tape and CA glue to hold my material down so I don't need tabs. If you're using something like cl uh, clamps, these can be quite useful to have turned on. But I'm going to turn them off for now just because I don't need them. Next thing I'm going to do is come over and select the inner shape. And I want to make this a little bit deeper. I don't want to go too deep, but if the material is 18 millimeters thick, I think I'm going to take this down to about 12 millimeters thick. So we've got a good bit of depth going on within that tray itself. And you can start to see the outcome on the visualization. And so again, nice deep tray, and it's cut out all the way around the outside. I've noticed that's at 12.4, so I'm just going to correct that to be precisely 12. And then we'll take a quick look at our cut settings. Now, as I've said in previous videos, I'm all, always conservative with my settings. So I'm going to take this down to 500 millimeters per minute. The plunge rate is fine, and I'm going to do it at depths of 0.5 millimeters per pass. The spindle speed, I'm just going to, it's a 20,000 spindle, so I'm going to take this up to 20,000 as well. Make sure it's running at maximum speed. And we're going to leave this as the offset cut because the other features are all part of the pro package. So with those set, as I say, this is a very simple project. Now, if you want to make this a bigger sweet tray or bigger catch all tray, you can select it, rotate it 90 degrees. And then obviously scale it up to fit your area that you're working with and you see we just get a slightly bigger variation i'm just going to leave it as the small one for now partly because it keeps the cutting time down to a minimum so i'm just going to undo that few steps there we are now i did say this would be a simple project and it really is so this one is now good to go so what we're going to do is export the g code we're going to come up to machine now this panel has changed a few times in recent months what we need to do is go to general settings and then we come down to the download g-code option for the most part you should be able to leave all these settings exactly the same make sure spindle control is set to automatic default rpm should be 20,000 in relation to the spindle that i've got obviously you adjust yours to your own spindle and then once we're done we can click generate g-code and it'll give us the files to get going and we can see it's already downloaded as an nc file so i'm now going to move over to the cnc machine and get this routed out 
And with a bit of light sanding, this is the outcome. Now I'm really pleased with this. I was a bit worried the walls may have been too thin given that it's softwood, but they're actually more than strong enough to hold whatever this needs to. We've also still got quite sharp corners on here. Obviously not sharp enough to hurt yourself, but sharp enough to give the shape a nice edge. Now I normally try and avoid knots when I'm machining through material, but this one has actually added a nice texture to the material, so I'm pretty happy I left that one in and the outcome is actually really good. Now obviously we've still got to apply some sort of finish to this. Now given that these may be filled with something like nuts or sweets without wrappers, give consideration to using food safe finishes. You can get clear ones, you can get stains, so yeah you've got a few different options. Stick around to the end of the video to see how I finish this particular one. Also remember, this is all about your creativity. You can do lots of options, lots of variations. So for example, you can stick to just using some of the basic shapes within easel. I've done a nice star here. I've gone deeper with the depth as well. So the actual finishing base of this is only four millimeters thick. So uh, yeah, it's giving a bit more depth, but it's still nice and strong and solid. And what about a bit more creativity on top of that? We've gone for a reindeer face. I've left the eyes and the nose in, so whenever you fill this up with something, obviously it's going to make the features of the face pop through whatever you fill inside of it. As I say, stick around till the end of the video to see how I'll finish all of these off. So for this one, we're going to create a window ornament or a table ornament, a Christmas tree that can stand up on its own. And the way we're going to do this is machine two pieces out that will essentially slot together in a cross format so that it can stand up on its own. Now in a similar way, we've created a new project, Christmas Designs 2. The material for this is slightly different to say we're using plywood. The plywood I'll be machining today is 6.5 millimeters thick, so I've set the thickness to 6.7 for that same reason I've already mentioned to guarantee that it cuts through all of the way. I'm also going to use basically the same design that we did earlier with the Christmas tree. So I'm going to come up and just find the tree again. For the purpose of the video, I'll just skip ahead slightly until this design is created. So there we have basically the same shape that we created earlier, except I've added a base this time to give it more stability when we assemble it later and stand it up. So I'm going to come over to the apps area now. Actually, I'm going to select the shape first, come over to the apps area. We're going to scroll down to find the interlock feature. Now, as always, we're presented with a series of options. And what we can see on the illustration on the right hand side is that it creates a, a duplicate of the original graphic and it also puts a channel down the middle. Obviously, these two channels interlock, allowing it to then stand up or become one singular piece. Now, the slot position is where you expect it to sit on the graphic itself. So 0.5 is in the center. And obviously, if you slide it left or right, the slot itself will also move in relation to the graphic. I'm going to leave that at 0.5 because I need it to be in the center. Now the notch size itself, this is the basically the thickness of your material. 6.5 millimeter in inches is just under 0.256. So I'm going to put 0.256 in because I do want to allow a fraction, a little bit of room to make sure it slots together okay. Hopefully it doesn't leave too much room because then you get a fairly loose, um, a loose connection, a loose slot between them. But I'm going to do this for the first test and see how I get on. For the bit size, we're using a 1 8 bit. So in decimal place numbers, that is 0.125. And so now we'll click import and it creates a duplicate of our graphic. We can now delete the original one. I'm going to select both of these and drag them over into view. And if I rotate the visualization, we can see basically what's going on. It's cutting an outline profile of those shapes. And then as I say, we can slot them together a little bit later. You may also see on the slots as well, if I zoom in slightly, we have these little rounded corners. Now these are called dog bones. What this is, is when you're creating interlocking pieces, because some edges will have square corners and some will have rounded, it allows them to slide together nice and easy and make sure they butt up as well as they actually should do. Now that's kind of okay, it's a basic tree, it's going to stand up, it's got a star on top, but let's make it a little bit more festive. So what we're gonna do is come up and we're gonna add, click the circle icon, and we're gonna create some ball balls on the tree. I've shrunk these down quite small. We're going to make the depth the full cut as well. And then we're just going to position a few of them around on the tree. So all I'm simply doing is pressing Control C and Control V to create duplicates. And we'll just scatter these about all over the two different trees. I also want to add a little bit of tinsel to this. So I'm going to come up to the line tool 
I'm just going, going to draw a slight diagonal line going across here and then hit escape after we've done one line. Now what I'm going to do is come to the edit points. I want to select one of the points and then click curved. And it gives us the, this option to make the line with a curve by adjusting the handles. Now we can rotate these round and I say it just start, starts to allow that line to be slightly curved. So let's put some tinsel on this tree. I'm going to put one there again. I'm going to make sure it cuts all the way through. Now as we can see, as I've just done that, the tabs icon has come up. As mentioned before, because I'll be using blue tape to hold all this down, I'm not going to be using the tabs, so I'll turn those off. And then we're going to press Control C, Control V, create a duplicate, and we'll try and get another piece of tinsel up here. And let's shrink that down a little bit and maybe put that one about there. I'm just going to move that F, that ball ball there above it slightly so that everything, nothing's too close. And then I'm going to put some on the other side as well. So we'll press Control V. Now, even though we've got this slot in the middle, we can still have the actual cut going across the two of them. And let's put another one a little bit higher than that. And I'm going to shrink that one down as well. There we have it. Now we've started to got a, get a fully decorated tree. Now because we're using a 1 8 bit for this uh, project today, we can't go into too much detail with um, the design on the tree. But if you wanted to use a smaller bit, for example, you could insert lots of stars on the tree. If I shrink this down, we will see basically what's going to happen. Now, as I was zoom in on the visualization, even though this is a five pointed star, as you can see, the star itself starts to come out pretty rounded because we're using a 1 8 bit. If I punch that all the way through, it's not going to look quite as sharp as it would do if it was a normal star. So that's one thing to bear in mind. If you want to use a smaller bit, you can get some better decorations on these trees. But I'm just going to delete that out for now. The other thing I just want to check at this point is that because we have some decoration in the middle, I want the outline cut for both pieces to be the last thing that is cut. So I want it to do the um, the tinsel or the flocking and the ball balls first and then do the outline cut last. So I'm just going to simulate this quickly and wind it back and we'll see the order that it does it in. And that's fine. It's doing the flocking, the tinsel, the outline, then it moves over and does exactly the same on the other side. Now, in terms of your material, what we can see is we've got a lot of white space here that's not being used. So to get the most out of your material at this point, what we can do is select one of the designs, rotate it around 180 degrees. I'm just going to come back to shape and make sure that is 180 degrees exactly. And then we can bunch these up a little bit closer to each other. You don't want to get them too close purely because you don't want the wood splitting as it's cutting through. But what we can see from this example here is straight away we've now just freed up a lot of space. If you're doing these in a production environment, for example, it means you can get at least another one on here, or sorry, another half, and then continue this on for the rest. Or you can even add other designs using this spare space in the material. So it's one thing to consider when you're machining these out is about getting the most out of your material. Now we'll just go and check the cut settings to see what we've got. It's remembered our settings from the last project. So with that done, I think we're good to get this machined and let's see how it comes out. As soon as I started cutting these bits out, I realized I'd made a mistake. Did any of you spot it? Well, I used an upcut bit on plywood. And if I flip these over, you will hopefully the camera can just about pick up some of the tear out along the edges with the grain. Now I didn't follow my own advice here. Using an up cut bit with plywood usually ends in these tear out edges. I should have used a down cut bit to get better results. But with a little bit of light sanding, it's not come out too bad. And we can continue with this. Now the other thing I was concerned about was the gap um, in between them. Because I kind of estimated what it needed to be. But actually it slides together really well and there's not mo any movement in it at all. So we can stand our little tree up now and take a look at it from different angles. Now, if I went back and did this again, I'd probably take a bit more time to align the uh, slots up in these tinsel, just so it actually looked a bit more uniform and the gaps came together, because I think that would look a little bit more effective. But ultimately, the tree is finished. It's actually come out not too bad. Again, we'll probably apply some sort of finish to this, so stick around to the end of the video to see how I finish it off. 
So for this one, we're going to keep it nice and simple. I want to create some sort of big ornament that can sit on the windowsill. And basically, we can wrap fairy lights around it to make it look nice and festive. So what we're going to do is cut out a big star out of our material, also with the inside of it cut as well. So basically, we're just going to get the outline of the star. Now, we can come up and use the star tool that is already in the shapes palette. But I just want to show you something about this. If I stretch the star up to be bigger, now on the surface, it looks like a normal uniform star but if I start to rotate it round we can see it kind of looks a little bit unusual Now the reason for this is it's actually distorted in one direction over the other so if we take it back to vertical and basically the star is narrower on the width than it is on the height basically it's a bit distorted so what we can do is use the star generator so we're going to come over to the apps menu scroll down and find the star generator there we are now, number of points is fairly obvious. It controls the amount of points in the star. You take it up, you get more points. Take it down, you get less. The inner radius is these inner points in the center, how close you want them to the center or further away from the center. Now, I want it to be not a quite a chunky star, so I think I'm going to get it about 60, something like that. Yeah, that will do nicely. I'm going to click Import. I'm going to drag this up to be nice and big again. Now, because we want to cut this out basically as a standalone shape with the inner cut as well, we could use the offset tool to do something similar to what we did before. But if we come down and take a look at the offset tool, and as we start to use this, you see how it creates radiuses around the outside, it starts to bend the shape. Even if we switch it to the inward version and then drag the distance up slightly, you'll see how you get some that are points and then some are very radius. I want to keep all of the, um, basically all the points on the line as points. So I want to cancel this for now. But what we're going to do first is make the cut line to an outline shape. And that is now cutting on the outside of the path. And we're also going to take the depth up to full while we're messing about with this and turn the tabs off. Now what we're going to do is press Control C, Control V to create a copy of this. We're going to bring it over and shrink it down a little bit and then we're going to select both objects together center them on vertical and center them on the horizontal now this isn't quite thick enough so the first thing we need to do is switch the cutting method for the inner star the outside one is on the outside but we want the inside star to cut on the inside so we'll come down and change the cutting path to the inside of it and as we see now that gives us a little bit more room all around the outside now even though these are both centered together obviously the diff there is a slight offset between them if we look closely for example if we look at the gap between these two lines here versus the two just above it we can see that it is slightly offset now this is just due to the nature of the um, of a star shape the dimensions of it are not perfectly square so when you center align them they will be slightly off but what we can simply do is click onto the inner star and just jog that about slightly until we feel it's a little bit more even all the way around like that is. Actually, I do want the star to be slightly thicker than where it is. So I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit more. We'll undo that, lock the proportion so it all shrinks together. Recenter them again, just do this very quickly. And again, just adjust that slight offset because of the star being slightly different proportions. Now, if we look at the visualization, that's looking pretty good. Basically, we're going to get this five point star and we just want the outside of it. And as I say, we can then wrap some fairy lights around it at the end to make it look nice and festive. And now we can get this exported and get the new job done. And so we've got the finished star. Yes, it's quite a simplistic cut, but that is the whole point. It's just simplistic designs that are easy to sell and that can look quite effective. So wrap this in some cheap fairy lights and it's gonna look really nice. And it can be stood up, as I say, as well as lent against something. Also remember, when you're doing shapes like this, the inners can be quite effective as part of the setup as well. So for example, these two could be stood up on a windowsill next to each other. And, you know, it just creates a bit of a set and say it makes it more sellable. Now, going back to what we've already covered, your creativity is key here. So here's another design that I've done. It's a jumping reindeer, kind of in a, almost a full circle, but with a flat bottom. So this allows it to stand up. And again, it can just be quite effective as a nice little Christmas gift. You can replace the reindeer. You could put bells in there or something else. So it's really all up to your creativity. Another design that I like and that I've produced 
is this Christmas tree or just a tree and then with an inner cutout of it inside. We've also put this little hook in place and this means that when it is stood up, you can actually put something like a ball ball or maybe a photograph of a loved one or a relative hanging from that and it just makes it more customizable. Now just as a reminder, all the files and designs I use in my tutorials are given away for free unlike some other YouTube channels. But it does cost money to keep the channel going, to buy the products and the tools to make everything possible for the tutorials. Now Patreon is a great way to support the channel but I know that can be too big of a commitment for some people. If you enjoy the channels and everything that I provide then do consider buying me a digital cup of coffee to keep the channel going by using the links in the description below. So for this one we're going to make a we wish you a merry christmas sign now we're using the same layout again for the 3018 the same measurements except i've changed the thickness of the material to 5.5 because we're going to machine this out to some thinner plywood first thing we're going to do is come to the text tool and we're going to use the bemio font now this is a nice bold font but i want it to be slightly narrower on the width so i'm going to shrink it down a little bit we're going to bring it up and let's click into type and we're going to put it all in capitals we wish I'm going to come off, click back on it, Control C, Control V to make a copy of it, bring it down below. We want to leave a little slight gap between them, but not too much. And then we're going to type U A Merry. And then we're going to press Control V again to do another copy of it. And again, bring it down slightly below and put Christmas. We want these to be joined up so what we're going to do is draw a thin rectangle in between each layer to connect all the different words so we put the square tool in we're going to shrink this down to be nice and thin and then drag it out to be the full width i think we can condense that down a little bit more so we want this to be relatively thin now the key here is to make sure that it's touching all the letters so if we bring that in a little bit and same on the other edge and then we're going to press Control C, Control V again, make a copy of this, and do exactly the same just below it, and rest it there. And we're just going to bring the Christmas up slightly just to touch the bottom of that line, as I say, just so it connects all of the letters. Now, what we're going to do at this point is select them all and press the center button. So it brings them in and makes it into a nice little sign. Now, I think we can do something extra with this as well, like maybe put a star on top or a couple of stars to try and make it look a bit better. I'm also going to put one of these lines on the bottom as well, just so it's almost got something to stand up on. So if we place that there, bring the width in a little bit on both sides. There we are, it's about right, shift that over just a fraction. And again, we're going to put one of those on the top and just let's add a couple of stars to it. So when you get roughly in position, say so just bring the width in. You don't want too much overhang because it can look a little bit scruffy. But that's looking pretty good. Now if we bring the star tool in and let's use, let's put three stars. Let's have quite a big one. So we want again that just touching the rectangle that we put in. We press Control C, Control V, and let's make some smaller ones either side of it. Control C, Control V, and move that over to the other side. Now we're doing this roughly by eye. Obviously, you can take a little bit more time to get them better aligned if you're doing this um, yourself. Now let's select everything and let's make it try and fill as much of the space as we can without going too big. And now we start to have our We Wish You a Merry Christmas sign. Now we can see on the visualization obviously that this is looking quite rounded because we're using a 1 8th bit. We're going to switch that to a 1 16th bit in a second. But what we want to do first is make this all into an outline cut. So we're going to select everything and then we're going to come up to the cut option and instead of a pocket cut, we're going to say cut on the outside. Now straight away, obviously, you can see that kind of looks a bit messy because all the shapes are overlapping each other. It is a good opportunity at this point. You can start to level things out and space them a little bit better where we've got a bit too much overlap between the different items. But ultimately, what we want to do is combine all these into one outline cut. So with everything selected, we'll right click, go to combine. Now, as you can start to see, that start becomes a little bit clearer on the visualization. If we go back and select this again, and what we want to do is make sure this is a full depth cut, 
we'll turn off the tab. And what I can actually see is that when we merge it all together, it's gone to cut on path. I want this to remain as cut outside path. So I'm going to select that again. And we can see the visualization actually now looks terrible because say we're using quite a big bit to try and do lettering and wording. So we're going to come up and swap the bit out for a 1 16th bit. And there we can see it starts to bring all the detail back into the sign. So we've got clear cut letters that will have some shape and definition to them. Now in using a 1 16th bit, again, you want to slow down your speeds and depth of cut. Obviously, they can be quite fragile and you don't want to break them. But ultimately, that is the sign done. So we can get this one exported. Again, get over to the machine and get it cut out. So let's take a look at the various finishes I've applied here. We'll start with the We Wish You a Merry Christmas. Now bear in mind that this can be stood up, it can also have some string put on it to be able to hung from a door or something similar. So it can be quite versatile. In terms of finishing it, now getting into all of these nooks and crannies with something like a paintbrush might be a bit difficult. So simply what I've done here is applied a clear coat to the front and the back just to give it some protection and durability. If you do want to paint it, obviously you can do. Maybe something like spraying, it might be easier to get into all of those awkward areas. It's just an option, but yeah, I've just gone with a clear coat on this to be safe. Now let's take a look at the trays. I'm going to start with the one on the left. I really liked the way this grain came out, so I wanted to do everything to emphasize it. As a result, the product that I've used on this is by a company called Osmo. It's called Polyex. It's a mix, it's kind of a waxy oil that you apply to it. It leaves a really nice durable finish and it just makes all the grain pop out in the wood. So that came out really nice. The next one I'm a little bit less impressed with. This was a dark oak stain that I applied to it. Now one thing you have to remember, when applying stains to something like this, even when you've sanded the inside of it, it will really emphasize any marks that are remaining from where the bit has cut. So that's just something to remember, is that if you are doing these, it may be better and safer to just use clear coats because that doesn't highlight it as much, whereas the stain really leaves the marks from where you've got slightly rougher edges. Even though this feels flat, the stain has just made those marks stand out a bit more. I also tried to add a bit of color on the nose, basically just to make this a little bit more interesting. The star bowl, this was a um, smoked walnut finish I applied to this. Again, a stain a bit like that one. I don't know if the camera can pick it up. Even though this is fairly flat, you can still see some of the emphasis on the marks from where it is finished. So I think my advice with these would definitely be lean towards the clear coat finishes as it may look a bit better. Alternatively, perhaps painting as opposed to staining might give you better results because as I say, some of these marks, they almost make it look a little bit untidy. Now let's move on to the snowman and the Christmas tree. So what I've done with these two is used a stain again, but it's from a company called Chestnut. They're called Chestnut Spirit Stains. And I'm really impressed with the colors from them. These have had just one coat. And as you can see, it's nice and vibrant. The coverage on it is excellent. So it's definitely an option to consider if you want to start applying vibrant colors to your wood and material. Now let's take a look at the reindeer and the tree. Again, I've used the same coating on these two as I did on the first tray. We've used the Osmo PolyX oil, again, just to give it some durability to make the grain pop, because I think the design of these work on their own. You don't need anything to, to add to them to try and make them more impressive. And finally, we'll take a closer look at the stars. Now, what I've done here is basically given them a quick blast with a blowtorch, something like this. You don't need to go too much, but it just really emphasizes the grain and gives it a darker texture. I've then applied the same dark oak stain that I did on the reindeer head to this one as well. It just gives it this really nice rustic feel. Now, you can, you have to be careful when doing stuff like this. You don't want to go overboard with the burning because you can ruin it. Just a light charring on the wood makes the grain pop and ultimately just gives it that nice rustic finish.
So those are just some ideas to get you started, but it's all about your creativity. Any shape that relates to that season, you can probably make into one of these style of gifts. Whether it's angel wings, a set of Christmas bells, a Santa hat, for example, could make a great example of one of the trays that we've done today. It's just about finding the shapes to work with or drawing them out. And Google is always a good option when you're looking for those silhouettes and vectors to use. Now, obviously, I haven't personalized any of the gifts I've done today. But what's stopping you from engraving a name, for example, in the bottom of one of those trays? or even on the base of one of the ornaments. You can really do a lot with them, just with a little bit of creativity. Hopefully this is enough to get you started and thank you all for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, as always, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done so already. It helps the channel out a lot. Final thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. You really help the channel out. I will see everyone on the next episode.